Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state um, or even now across the country. Yay. We are free and available for anybody who wants to, to watch our live sessions or to watch um, any of our previously recorded sessions. Um, we do the, our sessions, we broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But as I said, everything is recorded, so if you can't join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. Go to our website and um, you can watch all of our recordings. Um, and we do all sorts of things here. We have interviews, presentations, little mini training sessions, whatever we can think of and come up with that might be of interest to librarians. Um, today we have our regular annual, I guess, <laughs> um, session about summer reading program coming up this year, summer reading program 2012. Um, the main the children's theme, Dream Big um, Read, and the teen theme, Own the Night. Um, and we have Sally Snyder, the coordinator of children's and uh, young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission, who's going to tell us all about um, what's going on with that program and all the cool books that you can use. Okay. All right, so I'm going to hand over to both of you, and you are good to go. Thank you. Well, we'll just get started because I have about an hour's worth of talking to do. <laughs> and I have my script so that I won't go longer than that, I hope. But um, you are not moving. Oh, there, there we go. Okay, we'll start with picture books, fiction. And the first one, this one's so fun, Empire <laughs> by Sudipta Barda Kuala. Duck is hungry, so he goes out in the night to the house to raid the refrigerator. On his walk back to the barn, he is stalked by the vampire. Told in rhyme with not too scary illustrations, the story maintains tension until the not scary re resolution. Listeners will enjoy the hulking shadowy form of the vampire and laugh at the story's end. The Longest Night by Marion Dane Bauer is a lyrical story about the winter solstice, though it is never named. The animals of the forest want the sun back and one by one state that they are the ones to do it. But the wind always says, no, until a chickadee asks, well, who will do it? And the wind says, you. Beautiful artwork accompanies this story of the smallest doing the most important work. Wait, there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> no Sleep for the Sheep by Karen Beaumont is great fun. Sheep settles into his nice, comfy straw bed in the barn ready for sleep when, one by one, Another animal quacks or oinks or moos, looking for a good place to sleep. Poor sheep never gets to sleep at all until morning. Animal sounds and repetitive phrases will encourage your story time group to join in. The pile of animals asleep in the straw changes with each edition. So the kids can look for that. How what the pile look like now? A Bedtime for Bear is a sequel to A Visitor for Bear. These are both by Bonnie Becker. Mouse comes by for a sleepover. Now, Bear is more particular than Mouse, and Bear needs everything to be completely quiet in order for him to fall asleep. Mouse is a little bit of a jokester, or, you know, Mouse has his own way of doing things, so there's a little bit of an issue there until things get settled in and they can go to sleep. It's a good follow-up to the first book. Vampire Boy's Good Night by Lisa Brown. Bella is a boy vampire, and his friend Morgan, a little witch, go out into the night on her broom to look for children. Morgan thinks that they don't exist. They find a well-lit house and a Halloween party, and they join them and don't see any children anywhere because they're all in costume. Mm -hmm. They only see others like them. Lots of clever and fun touches to be noticed by child and adult. As you turn the pages at the beginning of the book, you might spot the legs in striped socks and ruby slippers underneath Morgan the witch's house. Kind of fun. Gracie, the Lighthouse Cat by Ruth Brown. One night, a storm has engulfed the lighthouse and the nearby area. Gracie, the cat, is snug, but her kitten is looking for adventure. Out the window, we see a wrecked ship and people huddled on the rocks. Grace, the daughter of the household, runs to join her father in rescuing nine people. The kitten follows her and accidentally falls into the sea. It's a double rescue. Gracie saves her kitten, and Grace and her father save the people. The story in the book is all about the cat and her kitten. The people action is always happening in the background, either through the window or like in this scene where the cat is at the foreground and the lighthouse is at the back. 
There's a brief story of Gracie and her father that appears on the end papers that looks like it was in the newspaper. So that story might, I haven't looked it up, it might have actually happened. Snowmen at Night by Carolyn Buner. Discover what snowmen are up to at night and why they look quite disheveled in the morning. It's lots of fun. The Boy in the Moon by James Christopher Carroll. A small boy goes out to romp and howl with the animals in one flower when the crescent moon gets caught in a tree. The boy tries to get it out, but it, he is not strong enough. He pulls and pushes, but the moon is stuck. Then he thinks to feed the moon all of the apples in the tree. The moon grows full and round and rolls right out. This is a celebration of the wild insiders and a pat on the back for being clever. Oh, this is one of the several Five Little Monkeys stories that are out there, but I love this one because it's Five Little Monkeys Reading in Bed by Irene Crystal. Children will enjoy this version and soon be helping with Mama's refrain of Lights out, sweet dreams, no more reading in bed because they're up way too late. The bright colors of the artwork add to the fun and there's a bit of a twist at the end. What's fun about this is Mom does read them a couple of stories, but there's five monkeys and there's three more stories that they want read. And so when she goes and turns out the light, they use the flashlight to read the next story, but then they start making too much noise. And Mama catches them. Elliot Jones' Midnight Superhero by Anne Cockringer. Elliot is quiet by day, but at night he rescues the ships in a storm, recovers the queen's jewels, and returns teddy bears to babies. One night, all his skills are tested. A giant meteor is headed to the earth. Elliot must save the day. But being a superhero is tiring, so by day, Elliot is quiet. Librarians will notice that Elliot is reading at the beginning of the story, and maybe his daydreams and adventures are prompted by the books he reads. He is definitely dreaming big. Night Night by Owen Davy. That's night, N-I-G-H-T, night, K-N-I-G-H-T, for people who are listening and not seeing the pictures. <laughs> In a boy's imagination, he is a knight getting ready for bed. He rides his trusty steed down the hall and up the stairs. He does all the usual tasks dressed as a knight. We see the colander on his head and his pajamas instead of his knightly garb in only a few illustrations. The most noticeable, most, most noticeable being the front end papers, where a cutout of the cover reveals the real boy. It makes going to bed a fun adventure. And this is a slightly older book, but it fits the theme so well, and I just think Mercy Watson is great fun. Mercy Watson Fights Crime by Kate DiCamillo. It's the third book in the series. A noise at night wakes Mercy, who thinks someone might be making hot buttered toast. She finds a burglar in the kitchen, but lays down to sleep since she is so tired. When the burglar steps over her to leave, she stands up and runs outside, with the burglar riding her like a bronco. Soon the neighbors, the police, and the fire department are involved. And eventually, everyone does get hot buttered toast. In Front of My House by Marianne DeBoot, a progressive story starting with On a little hill behind a brown fence under a big oak tree is my house. In front of my house, a rose bush. And it goes on from there, from the house, to places in a storybook, onto a mountain where we spend some time in the dark, and then off to sea. Kids will enjoy, and then they might want to help tell another such story together as a group. You could start with, in back in my backyard is, and see where they, where they go with that. While the World is Sleeping by Pamela Duncan Edwards. A snowy owl takes a child on a ride throughout the land to see what is happening while people sleep. They see deer in the meadow, fish, a fox, and other animals all out and about while the world is sleeping. The phrase is repeated at the end of each refrain on every page. This bedtime poem focuses on nocturnal animals with full page illustrations of the world under the glow of a full moon. The Fox in the Dark by Allison Green. Rabbit is running home in the night. He is being chased by a fox and he makes it home safely. But one at a time, other animals knock on his door for safety. He lets in a duck, a mouse, and a lamb. But next at the door is a fox. The fox starts to cry and says he has lost his mother. What will the animals do? Will they let him in? Fun, a little scary, and shows empathy for others. 
Moonlight by Helen B. Griffith. <clears throat> Rabbit is up waiting for the moon. He's just woken up and he's a little tired. He hops back down in his burrow to snooze a little more and just then the moon comes out. A lot happens while he snoozes. The moonlight shines like better on many different creatures. But finally, Rabbit awakens and dances in the field. One or two sentences or, or phrases per page make this a good choice for a toddler story time. The Star Child by the Grimm Brothers is a retelling of a lesser-known Grimm fairy tale, sometimes titled The Star Money or The Shower of Gold. A little orphan girl sets off into the world with only a piece of bread, a hat, a coat, and a dress. As she walks, she encounters others one by one who are more needy than she, and so she gives away all of her possessions, even down to her shift. That night, some stars fall down to clothe her, and some others become money to reward her for her generosity. Beautiful illustrations add to the tale. Hmm. I've never heard of that. I had well, neither. I've read a lot of Grimm, but oh, not yeah. that one. <laughs> Bedtime for Bear by Brett Helquist. Bear is ready for bed for the winter, but his two raccoon friends want to play in the snow with him one more time. At first, Bear is mad. He's tired. But then he does join in, and he has a great time. Cavorting in the snow is drawn with humor and fun. Snowballs fly everywhere. It's a celebration of winter and of sleep, at least for Bear. Moon Watchers by Ressa Jalila Jalali. Sharon is nine, and she and her father watch for the new moon that will signal the beginning of Ramadan. This Muslim family lives in Maine and looks forward to Ramadan and the Festival of Eid. The moon's phases show the progression of their month of fasting. Sharon wants to fast this year, but she is too young. Her brother Ali is 12, and he will be fasting for the first time. Sharon's parents encourage her to think of good deeds she could do, because that is also a part of Ramadan. It's an excellent introduction to this annual Muslim event, and a brief note at the back of the book gives some additional information. Henry's Night by D.B. Johnson and Linda Michelin. This is the fifth book in the series that the authors and the authors note that their poetic text is inspired by Henry David Thoreau's book Walden. In this title, Henry is unable to sleep. He needs to get outside to hear the song of the night bird. He goes walking and walking and waiting for the song. It's a quiet, peaceful story, and he sees lots of nighttime happenings like fireflies. Ten Moonstruck Piglets by Lindsay Lee Johnson. Ten piglets climb out their window and they leap from, jump in the pond, dance, squeal, and more under the trance of the moon. Finally, their mama comes to find them and bring them home again. And on the front page of the, of the cover, inside the, the book, it says that this happens to piglets, that they get enthralled by the moon and they get out of their pens and cohort. And I've asked people across the state, and I had one librarian tell me that they had had pigs, and they, she said, piglets get out all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't verified that this has anything to do with the mood, but it's a funny they story. Do they do escape <laughs> a lot. Pajama Pirates by Andrew Kramer. Ready for bed, three siblings begin their imaginary trip to find treasure, encounter pirates and sharks, and trick them just in time to head for home. The bedroom transforms into the sea and at one bed into a boat, luring the reader onto an adventure. There's nothing too scary here to keep the kids up at night. This is great fun. This one, you can do some things with this one. The Great Moon Hoax by Stephen Krinsky. During the summer of 1835, the New York Sun began reporting on the incredible sights a brand new telescope could see on the moon. Now that part of the story really happened. And the the editor of the paper said that this new telescope was in South Africa. So in 1835, it was more difficult to verify. Was there really a new telescope? <laughs> there was not any kind. He made all of this up. But this story is told from the viewpoint of two poor newspaper boys. The sale of so many papers lets them rent a room and sleep in a bed, and they are just so excited. And so you get a sense of what their lives were like. Then the news comes out that all the stories were a hoax. And apparently he didn't really get into that much trouble. He just said, oh, sorry, okay, here's some other news, <laughs> as far as I can tell. But I didn't do a great in-depth research project on it. The book does include an author's note. So as a follow-up, you could ask your um, kids that are in the library, what incredible story would you write? Because the, 
things that are on the cover here, the flying men and the blue goat and the something about a buffalo back there, all of those were things that had actually been in the paper at that time that he said were all on the moon. Uh. <laughs> so I think it'd be great fun for the kids to make up whatever they wanted to and see if they could come up with some fascinating stories. The Little Moon Princess by Y.J. Lee is um, told in the form of an original folk tale. Before there were stars, a sparrow flies so high in the sky he reaches a moon and finds a lonely princess there. She has many jeweled flowers and she plays with them, but she's a little scared of all the dark when she looks up into space. The sparrow has an idea and helps the princess to light up the sky. And our signature artist for our summer reading program this year, Brian Lies, has three books so far about bats. The first being Bats at the Beach. The second is Bats at the Library. I have that book. That's my one. <laughs> if you can only buy one <laughs> library book. Yes, you have to yeah. have the library one. <laughs> and the third one is Bats at the Ballroom. Oh. One of the, and I'm going to back up here because one of the fun things is Bats at the Beach, um, they, they do the things that people do. They dig in the sand. They wear life jackets and water wings, race boats, and play volleyball. But there's one little bat who gets his, his red uh, water wings on his, um, on his wings mm -hmm. and in this book. And then if you look, you can find them at the library, in the Bats at the Library book. And you can also find them at the ball game. Oh, so I think that's a great true. thing that, that mm -hmm. carries through that while you can read the story and then say, now, where was the little bat with the water wings? Where did you find him? One Drowsy Dragon by Ethan Long. One dragon is, he's tired and all he wants to do is go to sleep, but the other dragons keep him awake with their various noises in this clever counting book. When finally the other ten dragons come to bed and he can finally sleep, they complain about the drowsy dragon snoring. I think that's just not right, <laughs> but it's great fun. Balloon on the Moon by Dan McCann. This is a slightly older book, but it is a Nebraska author, so I wanted to, and it works ah. it's great for this theme, too. When Jake's little brother's balloon flies up into the sky, Jake wants to help, and he thinks of a solution just before he falls asleep. Soon he joins a spa space flight to the moon. The team helps him into his suit, then the blast off, some free floating inside the ship, and more until they reach the moon. Jake returns triumphant to his brother's things. He has returned that balloon, found it on the moon, brought it back to his brother. It's a fun adventure with some factual details included about um, how things work on a space flight. It's Time to Sleep, My Love by Eric Metaxas and Nancy Tillman. This is a lyrical and loving bedtime tale. It's time to sleep, it's time to sleep, the fishes croon in water deep. The songbirds sing in trees above. It's time to sleep, my love, my love. Wonderful illustrations of many animals ready to sleep. Stars Above Us by Jeffrey Norman. At bedtime, Amanda admits to her father she is afraid of the dark. He takes her outside and they look at all the wonderful things there are in the dark. The next day, they put stars on the ceiling of her room and talk about both of them looking at the North Star while he is, is away in the military. A reassuring story about both the dark and about missing a parent. The father does come home by the end of the book. And Fancy Nancy is into it too. Fancy Nancy Stellar Stargazer by Jane O'Connor. Fancy Nancy and her family are planning to stay outside all night to do some stargazing before sleeping. Nancy thinks stars are magnificent. Her sister Jojo is impatient, so Nancy comes up with some things for them to do while they wait. But the weather may not cooperate. This Frangoline and the Midnight Dream by Clemency Pierce is great fun. Frangoline is a well-behaved child during the day, but at night she climbs out the window wearing her black cape and does exactly as I please. During her nighttime romp, she scares the scary creatures, the bear and the fox, irritates the ghosts, and more until she is sorry and she goes to home and goes back to bed. Until the next night when she's going to do exactly what she wants again. Rhyming text and Franklin's shouts of independence will appeal to young listeners. Frankie Works the Night Shift by Lisa Westbrook Peters. Frankie, a cat wearing an apron, works in a hardware store. 
The simple text and clever illustrations in this counting book reveal all of Frankie's duties. But when a mouse is on the scene, Frankie really gets to work. Kids will love the mess left behind and the fact that Frankie doesn't do much of anything during the day. Photos of real animals, tools, and furniture blend with drawings to give us a fun look at Frankie's night. <coughs> Where to Sleep by Candy Redzinski. Beginning with, if I were a kitten, where would I sleep? The kitten visits a number of different animals and places around the farm to sleep, but there is always something that prevents her from doing so, until she decides the best place is all curled up at my best friend's feet. Appealing illustrations in one sentence or two phrase for two-page spreads makes us a good choice for a toddler story time. Excuse me. <coughs> Going on. <coughs> Stars by Mary Lynn Ray. Excuse me. <coughs> the joy of stars is celebrated in this appealing title. While children cannot put a real star in their pocket, they can cut one out of shiny paper and carry it around. They can find stars in the garden, strawberry blossoms, in the woods, moss on a tree, and in winter, snowflakes. Crazy's wonderful illustrations convey the beauty and wonder of stars. <clears throat> Light Up the Night by Jean Reedy. Using a house that Jack built story form, the boy of the story tells us of his world and universe. His blanket becomes a spaceship, actually three different spaceships, a plane, a train, truck, and skateboard, its distinctive red and white pattern on each item. Once the story gets going, each two-page spread ends with, which circles the sun, which, which hides the space when the day is done, while stars glow bright and light up the night in my own little piece of the universe. Good Night, Good Night Construction Site by Sherry Dusky Rinker is great fun. A poetic look at various machinery at work in a construction site. Four pages each tell of a particular machine and its work on the building. And then that it is time to sleep. Clever illustrations show a cement truck with a blanket only covering a part of his drum, and a bulldozer snuggling into the piles of dirt that look like a bed. Sure to be a hit at story time. Blackout by John Rocco tells of a boy whose parents and older sister are too busy to play a board game with him. When all the lights of the city go out, the family first climbs to the roof of their apartment house and looks at all the other people on the roofs of their apartment houses. But looking down, they see many members of their neighborhood on the street. So they go down and join them. When the lights come back on and the family climbs back to their apartment, um, they decide to turn the lights out and play the board game with the boy by candlelight. Beautifully illustrated and told mostly in comic book format, the illustrations are still large enough to convey the dark atmosphere and the feeling of camaraderie among the neighbors. Great fun. Night of the Pumpkin Heads is another Halloween type book. Michael J. Rosen is the author. The pumpkins want to be really scary this Halloween, so they have a contest to see who is scariest, and that pumpkin will be crowned head of jack o -ween. Amazing carved pumpkins illustrate the story with a brief how-to on the last two-page spread and a recipe for roasted pumpkin seeds. The pumpkin on the front of the book is a pretty standard-looking pumpkin, but open the pages and my, they're, they're amazing. <clears throat> Tony Ross has written, I want my light on. The little princess loves the bedtime story her dad reads, but she wants her lights on. She's worried about ghosts. One at a time, her father... The admiral, the doctor, and the maid all tell her that they don't exist, unless they're very small, says the maid. Once the light is out, she thinks maybe ghosts are afraid of the dark, too. Impossible. Brownie and Pearl Hit the Hay by Cynthia Ryland. One to three short sentences per page tell the reader about Brownie and Pearl getting ready for bed, from a bath and then jammies to a snack to a story and then to bed with a moon blanket. Very simple story, but great fun. Who's There by Carol Lexa Schaefer. A little bunny runs home and jumps in bed and then begins to hear strange night noises. 
who wonders if the noises could be a crusty, dumpy ogre, or a grimy, gooey, gooey, or other such frightening things. Each time he thinks of a scary creature it might be, he looks at his toy bunny, who is sitting hush-hush quiet. So he does too. When the culprit is revealed, kids will feel safe, secure, and superior. Good opportunity for the kids to think of other monster names and create a drawing of the creatures they think he might have had hiding there. Starry Night, Sleep Tight doesn't have a particular author. Um, it's a bedtime book of lullabies. 23 lullabies with cozy illustrations. There is no music included, but you are certain to know at least a few of the, of the tunes. Heavy paper is used with one to three lullabies per two-page spread. The House in the Night by Susan Marie Swanson is the 2009 Caldecott Medal winner. And it begins, here is a key to the house. In the house burns a light. In that light rests a bed. On that bed waits a book. A simple and beautiful bedtime tale about going out and exploring the world at night. The World Champion of Staying Awake by Sean Taylor. Stella's father tells her it is time for bed, but she knows she first has to get Cherry Pig, Thunderbolt the Puppet Mouse, and Bean Bag Frog to sleep. And each of them claim to be the World Champion of Staying Awake. She has a clever plan for it, having them imagine riding in a boat, on a train, and then on a hot air balloon, and one by one they fall asleep. The art goes to a full page each time during their imaginary trips and then receives to use a white border during the real time. <clears throat> I have two Twinkle Twinkle Little Star books. The first one I'm going to talk about um, is a um, more simplistic artwork, the children's song with no music included has delightful illustrations of a shining star and the boy who wonders about it. It's good for toddler times and for one-on-one -on -one sharing. A finger play is described at the back of the book. But the second title is illustrated by Jerry Pinkney. And um, if you could only buy one, I would recommend the Jerry Pinkney title. Probably you've already decided that yourself. <laughs> Unless you're really looking for toddler time books, in which the first book is great for that. With Jerry Pinkney's, it's a different take on the children's song. Pinkney depicts a curious chipmunk who wonders and dreams about the star. The text includes additional lines of the song. Lovely illustrations, of course, and the music and an artist's note are included. The Thirteen Nights of Halloween by Guy Velisovich is a fun look at the song The Twelve Days of Christmas, reset in, at night in Halloween. If you are play, planning to, you could plan different celebrations like Halloween night, New Year's Eve night, Christmas, if you want to go that direction, this would be fun. Witches, goblins, corpses, and more await. This is a book about the bear with sticky paws. The bear with sticky paws won't go to bed by Clara Bulamy. Lily will not stay in bed, and she jumps out there, and there at the front door is a small white bear. He does not want to go to bed either, so they fly through the night sky on the bed and land on an island where the bear eats some things and gets sticky paws. Apparently he always has sticky paws in all of the stories. He has lots of games for them to play, and Lily starts to say she's a little bit sleepy, but the bear has more to do. Until Lily climbs back into her bed and Mama tucks her in. It's not a new story, but it's fun and comforting with the last kiss from Mama. Stars, Stars, Stars by Nancy Elizabeth Wallace. Minna loves stars, so her mom takes her and some friends to a star party. Dinner at home, and there are some simple recipes included, and a trip to the new star space at the town's children's museum make for a wonderful time. A few activities you can recreate for your group, and some good basic information, and they do some stargazing at the end of the evening. <clears throat> Bedtime Bunnies by Wendy Watson. With a call of bedtime bunnies, the five bunny children begin their nighttime ritual. The story is told through the illustrations with four different onomatopoeic words on each page. It conveys the act changing action as the bunnies eat, get ready for bed, and think about what they might be dreaming. Listeners will love hearing and repeating the words if you take the time for it. Watch the youngest bunny, only he has noticed it's beginning to snow. Max and Ruby's Bedtime Book by Rosemary Wells. It's bedtime, and Max and Ruby keep begging for more stories from Grandma, until after the third story, all three of them are asleep. 
Can You See What I See on a Scary, Scary Night by Walter Wick? Subtitled Picture Puzzles to Search and Solve, this choice is a takeoff on the Dark, Dark Night story. Twelve tableaus slowly move into to focus on a castle on the hill and then inside it. The many items to search for will be enjoyed by fans of the I Spy book. It's lots of fun and I still have not found everything because <laughs> I had to move on and read some other books. <laughs> the Night Before Summer Vacation by Natasha Wing is told in the form of The Night Before Christmas and we join the family packing for their trip. Listeners should find it fun and enjoy the idea of reworking the Christmas poem. There's also The Night Before Preschool and the night, I think she has several other titles out, but I like the idea of the night before summer vacation. Charlotte Jane Battles Bedtime by Myra Wolf. Pirate-born Charlotte Jane the Hardy embraces pirate life with gusto. Bedtime holds no appeal to her, so she stays up later each night until finally she stays up all night. But her oomph is gone. There is only one solution, and Charlotte gives in. Supportive parents allow Charlotte to learn her own lesson, and what a great house. You can't see it on the cover, but it's built to resemble a ship. Jane Yolen has written Creepy Monsters, Sleepy Monsters. Monster kids leave school and head for their cave where mom, mom feeds them, has them bathe, and go to bed. Usually two lines per two-page spread. Monsters creep, monsters crawl over this meadow and up the wall. She calls it a lullaby, but there's no music included. It's, it's in poetic form, and well, the monsters are not too scary either, as you can see. Some nonfiction picture books start with Dream Something Big, the story of the Watts Tower by Diana Hutz Aston. The story of Uncle Sam, whose name was Simon Rodia, and his creation of the Watts Towers, how he found value in broken bits of glass, faucet handles, wire mesh, piece, pieces of rebar, and more. It includes some photos of the actual towers towards the back. The story itself is told in this uh, collage format, or mosaic is really what I'm trying to say, mosaic format. So there are some photos at the back, an author's note, note with more information, and a two-page spread with a craft that readers can try. So lots going on there. He certainly did dream something big. Underground by Shane W. Evans has two to four word sentences per two-page spread that stress the need for quiet and secrecy as a family escapes from slavery. The night setting is highlighted by the shining stars and the whites of the runaway's eyes. The emotion of the escape comes through with the joy of freedom and the sun at the end of the book, and it will be a good choice for next summer too where the theme is, or the, the concept is underground, and they will have some activities about the underground railroad wow. again, so you get two years for one with this book. <laughs> I also want to tell you that if you look closely, you can tell that one woman has a baby during the night, but it's not obvious. Mm. You can only see her, the upper half of her body, in case you were worried about that. A slightly older book, Owls by Gail Gibbons, is still a great introduction to the young readers. The author covers the basics expected, types of owls in North America, how they hunt, the sounds they make, the two basic types, and the label part of an owl's body. Watercolor illustrations are appealing, and the last page has some tidbits of information not included in the rest of the text. It has become a habit <laughs> or, a, or an expected thing. Time to Sleep by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page is a fascinating look at the unusual way some animals sleep. From a giraffe to a longhorn bee, we see a total of 17 animals. Some of the unusual information is white, while, oh, white storks sleep while flying just for a few seconds at a time. The parrotfish creates a mucus cocoon for sleeping. Brief additional information on each animal is included at the back, and once again, wonderful illustrations. Switching on the Moon, a very first book of bedtime poems by Jane Yolen and Andrew Busek peters includes 60 poems about bedtime that range from 4 to, six to 20 lines. The 44 poets included are some of them are Alfred Lord Tennyson, Sylvia Plath, Lee Bennett Hopkins, and Jane Yolen. So if you wanted to, you could select poems out of this book or others to post daily or weekly and, and then encourage kids to write their own poems about the night. We have some beginning readers that will work for this theme. Fireworks for All by Karen Bars. This is based on a television script by Dietrich Smith because Martha is on TV now. Martha Speaks Martha. And this 
this book has text in all in English and also all in Spanish. When Martha finds out there will be fireworks on every Saturday night of the summer, she starts a protest movement asking the fireworks be banned. They scare dogs. A solution agreeable to all is worked out by the end. And the second book about Martha that's on the list today, Martha is excited about the camp out on Flea Island until she hears about Big Minnie, the monster that comes out at night. Everything is quiet that night until Martha and her dog friend Skits hear a terrible howling. The dogs hide in the tent until they all remember that Alice's brother howled just like that earlier in the day to try to scare them. So soon they have an idea to scare dogs. <laughs> Uh, this is an older Berenstain Bears book, but several of their titles will work for the theme. This is Bears in the Night by Jan and Mike Berenstain. Berenstain. It has seven young bears together in one bed who hear a sound and soon climb out the window down the tree to find out what made the noise. Simple, repetitive, and reminiscent of going on a bear hunt, the young bears get out of bed, to the window, at the window, out the window, till they climb Spook Hill and find a surprise. And it's still available in hardback. Dirk Bones and the Mystery of the Missing Books by Doug Cushman. Dirk Bones is a skeleton, and he's going to interview the famous author, Edgar Bleak, but is soon investigating the theft of his newest book. A strange leaf was left on the floor, and Dirk goes to the library for information. Their copies of Eric Bleak's, Edgar Bleak's books are missing, too. Soon Dirk is cutting through the green lagoon at night to solve the mystery. Natalie Engel has written Good Night, Sleep Tight, about Splat the Cat, based on the creation of Rob Scotton. Splat is planning to sleep out in the backyard, and his mom surprises him by inviting Plank and Spike to join him. Splat doesn't like Plank, or no, Splat likes Plank, he doesn't like Spike, Spike is mean to him. Spike tricks Splat and scares him, so Seymour, Splat's mouse friend, finds a way to scare Spike. Lots of fun with just a touch of scary. You could go a nonfiction route because there are several blast off readers that talk about nocturnal animals. This one is about raccoons. It's an early reader with very basic information about how raccoons live. Sid the Science Kid, I'm Not Afraid of the Dark by Carrie Meister is another book based on a television program. This takes a scientific approach to being afraid of the dark. Sid's teacher has the kids do a couple of experiments to discover that things stay the same in the dark so there is no reason to be afraid. It's got a good message, and some of the illustrations are a bit dark. I assume that's because they were pulled from the TV show, but it still has a good story. A Circle in the Sky and Un Circulo en el Cielo by Zachary Wilson are two separate books, but the same story. It's a look at shapes as the girl of the story builds a spaceship and flies to the moon. The colorful illustrations add to the text. This title includes several activities for children to do at home or in the library that's available as a separate title in Spanish. And then another nonfiction book, Asteroids, by Derek Goebel, uh, contains good introductory information on asteroids with one to three sentences per page. It also includes a glossary, index, and short bibliography. Fiction for grades two to five or so. I meant to say earlier that all of my grade ranges are in general, because we all know that some kids can read something generally harder for them, but if they're really interested, they'll read it. Or sometimes you pick up something that's really written for a younger age, but it's a fun story, so you read it. So I try not to be judgmental to give you a general idea. <clears throat> Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes by Jonathan Oxier. Peter is 10 at the beginning of the story. He's an orphan, and he has been blind all his life. He was taught how to steal and has been serving his teacher since his very early days. But well, once he steals a box that contains three sets of magical eyes, he is off on a journey to save a kingdom, if he dares. This has a little touch of uh, Lemony Snicket in it, because at the beginning of the story, when he's just a baby, he's being taught how to steal, so it's kind of a fantastical story in that way. And also there's magic and, and other things going on. It was great fun. Zora and Me by Victoria Bond and T.R. Simon is a fictional story with Zora Neale Hurston as the main character. Told by her friend Carrie, we see Zora as a storyteller, sometimes to the detriment of others, but not on purpose. And we watch as she, Carrie, and their friend Teddy 
learn about restraint and seeing things from other people's points of view. They have some adventures trying to help someone, and that all happens at night. So that's why the cover and the, a lot of the story fits the theme. There's a short biography, timeline, and bibliography that conclude the book. And this book was endorsed by the Zora Neale Thurston Trust, so they didn't take her name lightly. The Secret Zoo by Brian Chick. Strange things are happening at the zoo at night when Noah's younger sister Megan disappears one night. Noah gathers his and her friends to investigate the zoo at night, and they make an incredible discovery. Friendship and teamwork are key in this new series, series which is full of action. There's a sequel out already, The Secret Zoo, Secrets and Shadows, but I haven't seen it yet, so I have to get my hands on that. Night of the Spadefoot Toads by Bill Harley. Ben is in fifth grade. He loved the desert and spent lots of time studying the animals that lived there. Now his family has moved to Massachusetts, and everything is different. The climate, the animals, and he has no plans. His new science teacher is inspiring, though he is trying not to respond. Still, when he joins her one night to see the vernal pool and watch the spadefoot toads come out, he may find there are some inter interesting things about Massachusetts. The Summer of Moonlit, Moonlight Secrets by Danette Hoff Hallworth. Allie Jo is 11, and she has lived at the Meriwether Hotel in Florida as long as she can remember. It has seen better days, but it is still a destination for travelers. Chase is 13, and he has arrived with his father a travel writer who seems to chase anyway, to always be forming sentences for his project. Tara, 16, is hiding on the ground and often goes for moonlight swims in the, in the spring. She seems strangely unfamiliar with many words and things, but Allie Jo attributes that to her being from another country. Eventually, the mystery of who she is is solved when she tells her story. It turns out that she is a selkie and her fur has been stolen, so she can't return home. Of course, right away, Ellie, Joe, and Chase decide they'll help her, and then their adventure really begins. <clears throat> Emmy and the Rats in the Belfry by Lynn John L. is a sequel to Emmy and the Incredible Shrinking Rat. In this title, we find Miss Barmy is still a rat bent on revenge, along with her admiring accomplice, accomplice Cheswick Bull. Emmy is sent to spend some time with great aunts in Schenectady, but she wants to help Randy find his rat mom. And that takes them out at night. Many adventurous things happen. We hope, I hope there's a sequel to this one, too. Another book would be fun. The Secret of Zoom, by, also by Lynn John L., has adventure, a touch of fantasy, and heroics that all await Christina, who's 10. She misses her mother, who died when the laboratory blew up. Her father tries, but he also works at a laboratory and is distracted by his job. When Christina meets an orphan, Taft, they are soon uncovering both secret tunnels at night, and plots to keep the oppressed orphans working to extract an energy product called Zoom. Christina is determined to help. <clears throat> Every Soul a Star by Wendy Moss is probably my favorite book in this group. <laughs> Told from three points of view, Allie is 12, Bree is 13, and Jack is 13. <clears throat> An upcoming solar eclipse will bring the three characters and many others together. Allie lives with her family at a remote camp that will be ideal to view the solar event. She loves it there and is devastated to learn his fam her family is moving after the eclipse. Bree, a fashionista, is horror struck that she and her family are moving to take over the camp. Jack comes along with his science teacher in order to avoid summer school. Each of them have positive effects on the others as they work through their miseries and a solar eclipse solidifies their changes. <clears throat> There's a couple of books in a seven-book series called The Night Fairies. When it first came out, it was called The Twilight Fairies, but uh, wow. recently they renamed it to The Night Fairies. I wonder why. It's <laughs> fine. The first book in this series is Ava the Sunset Fairy by Daisy Meadows. <clears throat> Book one introduces the premise for all of the seven books. Jack Frost has stolen each of the Night Fairy's bags of magic dust. Humans, Rachel and Kirsty, who have helped the fairies in, and the other series in the overall Rainbow Magic set, are spending a week at Camp Stargaze when the fairies ask for their help. In this book, the sun cannot set unless Ava gets back her bag of magic dust. In book seven, the final book, Sabrina the Sweet Dreams Fairy, again by Daisy Meadows, 
Sabrina changes the girls into fairies to go with her to Jack Frost's castle to take back her bank of magic dust. So little girls who love fairies will have a great time with the seven book set this summer. They're in paperback. I don't think they're in hardback. Escape the Night, a Civil War Adventure by Lori Myers. Tommy is nine, and he and his younger sister, Annie, are saddened by the daily sight of wagons bringing injured or dead Confederate soldiers past their house and up to their father's church in Augusta, Georgia. Tommy encounters a soldier in the church turned hospital and ponders the man Red's poetry that says he wants to keep the nation whole. Why should, should Tommy turn Red in? Should he keep quiet? Tommy's struggle with this dilemma is, is realistic and heartfelt. This early chapter book has frequent illustrations and plenty of white space. Lights on the Nile by Donna Jo Napoli. Kepi is 10 and she lives near the Nile in ancient Egypt. Her mother faithfully prays to the gods and Kepi is aware of how careful they must be not to offend the gods. She rescues a baby baboon from a crocodile and raises it as her pet. When a couple of boys steal Babu from her, she runs after them to get him back. Soon she and Babu both are held captive by some men who intend to sell them when they reach the city. Kepi prays and plots for escape. She dreams of talking with the pharaoh to secure better treatment for those working on his pyramid because her father was injured in them. She also dreams of her family left behind, hoping she will see them again. This is an original origin story about the beginning of fairies by Hathor, the goddess of the night sky and of music. The Wizard of Dark Street by Sean Thomas Odyssey. Dark Street is a community that links the human world to the fairy world. The gate from Dark Street to the human world opens for one minute a day at midnight. The gate from Dark Street to the fairy world has been permanently closed because there was a revolution. Una Crate is 12 and she is niece to the current wizard and next in line for the honor. She has just given up her rights to the position because she wants to be a detective when he is suddenly struck dead. Now Una must find out who has done this and prevent the possible destruction of Dark Street and the human world. And I don't know if there's going to be another book about this, but they sure could if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. The Magic Tree House by Mary Pope Osborne has a book for every possible theme for the summer reading program, which is really terrific. This title, Dogs in the Dead of Night. Jack and Annie take the tree house to a valley in the Swiss Alps. They must find a certain flower, one of the items they need to, need to find, to help Merlin's assistance. But first, they are found and rescued by St. Bernard's and the monks who care for them at the nearby monastery. Snow is everywhere. How can they find the flower they need? <clears throat> Lucky Breaks by Susan Patron. Yeah, Patron. This is book two of the trilogy, and just so you know, in book two, it contains the words scrotum twice, because that was made such a big deal in the first book. Book two, about Lucky, she's almost 11, her adoptive mom, Bridget, has opened a weekends and holidays only restaurant and is doing pretty well. Through this, Lucky meets Paloma, niece of a geologist who was part of a group having lunch there on a Saturday. They hit it off and are soon talking Paloma's parents into letting her come and stay the next weekend, since that Sunday they will celebrate Miles' sixth birthday and Lucky's 11. Lincoln is tying knots and Lucky is frustrated that he won't tell her what he's working on. The girls go out into the desert to find the mine with maybe they can find the other half of a pin that was lost in it. And Lucky makes several bad choices and mistakes. But they get back all right. The last page of the book has an answer to Lucky's question about the Milky Way, and they pause to look up at the night sky. At the, night sky. The, the hardback has this nighttime scene on it, which is great for this summer reading program, but the paperback has a sunny yellow cover with Lucky in a hammock like a swing. So, buy the hardback, <laughs> or, you know, whichever one you want to. The Dreamer by Pam Munoz Ryan talks about the childhood of Pablo Neruda, or Neftali Reyes. His father was critical and task-minded, finding Neftali's wandering mind a frustration and a challenge. He continually told his son to stop dreaming. Neftali was intrigued by the natural world and found joy in small things. Lyrically told, this fictionalized story of this childhood will appeal to poets and dreamers themselves. <clears throat> Ladder to the Moon by Maya Sotoro. I'm doing my best to say her name. 
the last part of the hyphenated name for Sotoro dash ng. It's a picture book for older readers. This tells of a little girl who asks what her grandmother was like. Her mother says she was like the moon, full and soft and curious. That night, her grandmother arrives on a rope ladder outside her window and invites her on an adventure. They climb up to the moon. From there, they see the troubles on the earth and invite some children to join them. Mystical and beautiful, this book urges all of us to do what we can to help others. <clears throat> Barnaby Grimes series, Curse of the Night Wolf, is book one by Paul Stewart and Chris Riddell. I haven't seen any other titles in this series. Barnaby is a top-notch top TikTok lad, meaning he delivers messages throughout the town, usually using the rooftops in this London-like unnamed city. One night he encounters an incredibly strong wolf on the rooftops and becomes determined to learn more about where he came from, because as he suspects, it was a werewolf. I love Dragon Danny Dragon Breath by Ursula Vernon. There are two in the series two new ones that will fit. The first is Lair of the Bat Monster. Danny, a dragon, and his best friend Wendell, an iguana, are in the local swimming pool when they find a small bat trapped in the pool filter. Danny's mom sends them on the mysterious magical bus to one of Danny's cousins in Mexico, who is studying bats. A visit to the jungle, bat poo, the guano beetles that eat the poo, and maybe a huge monster will definitely appeal to readers. <laughs> Told mostly in text with numerous black, white, green, and an occasional blue illustration. The story is also occasionally told with a page or two of graphic novel format and then back to text. It's also great fun. There's a few cautions about don't pick up bats. They might have rabies or something that are told to the kids who are reading the book, so that's a good warning too. The second title, Dragon Breath number five, is no such thing as ghosts. It's Halloween. Danny, Wendell, and Christiana are trick-or-treating when Big Eddie the bully dares them to trick-or-treat at the nearby haunted house. When they knock, the door creaks open and their scary adventure begins. <clears throat> Some supernatural happenings with lots of creepy coincidences will appeal to fans of the spooky and Danny Dragon Breath fans as well. Illustrated in black, white, and green and occasional graphic novel pages. Young Fredel by Cynthia Voigt is a sequel to Angus and Sadie, but it's not necessary to read the first book before reading this one. Fredel lives with his extended family in the wall of the kitchen of the farmhouse. If you're not seeing, if you're just listening, then you don't know that there's a picture of a small mouse looking at the moon. That's Fredel. That's why they live in the wall. They follow strict rules about when they can forage on the kitchen floor at night. When Fredel becomes ill after eating chocolate with his cousin, he is cast out. The lady of the house sweeps him up and throws him in the rubbish pile because she thinks he's dead. Fredel recovers and has a whole new world to explore and to survive. The Star Maker by Lawrence Yep tells of the youngest of his family, brother and cousins, one day Artie, whose aide is goaded into making a brash promise that he will give all his extended family fireworks for the Chinese New Year. His uncle Chester promised to help him, as he is also the youngest of his generation. But when, when times turn bad for Uncle Chester, will he have the means to help? Set in 1954, this historical novel gives a sense of the times, the support of family, and the wonder of fireworks. The author includes a note stating that some of the fireworks he mentions are from his past and are no longer available for safety reasons. Some nonfiction for grades two to five or so. <clears throat> Thirteen Planets by Dwight Aguilar. Things change quickly sometimes. In 2008, Aguilar published Eleven Planets, A New View of the Solar System. Now the International Astron Astronomical Union states, as Aguilar says in his foreword, quote, there are eight classical planets and five dwarf planets, making 13, end quote. One two-page spread on each of those includes one full-page illustration and basic information about the planet, and also includes our sun and our moon. There's a glossary, an index, and a two-page spread of additional information. So, This is published by the National Geographic Society for, for Kids, so I think you're going in the right direction if you, if you grab this for your library. Night Flight by Robert Burley. 
a lyrical look at the determination and courage Amelia Earhart demonstrated during the first flight across the Atlantic by a woman, and only the second non-stop flight at that time. Illustrations dominate the pages with text in black or white as needed. And now, oh, and quote, now she must cross this dark and seething ocean. Why? Because, and they quote Amelia, women must try to do things men have tried, unquote. So it gives a real sense of her determination, who she was, and I did not realize until I read this book that her flight across the Atlantic was only the second nonstop flight. Right behind, well, I don't know how what the timing was, but we all know who did the first flight. Light Your Way, Make a Candle by Carla Mooney. This title gives some history of candles and candle making, as well as information on how candles are used by several different religions. The last two chapters each describe how to make either a rolled beeswax candle or a milk carton candle. Plenty of precautions are included for safety, and it, it does include a glossary and index. Dark Emperor and Other Poems of the Night by Joyce Sidman. This is the 2011 Newbery Honor Book. Twelve Poems of Night Animals and Activities. Each two-page spread has the poem on the left page and a major illustration with additional information on the right page. It includes a glossary. <clears throat> a Full Moon is Rising by Marilyn Singer contains 17 poems celebrating the moon and including some science, some customs, and some cultural celebrations from around the world. A world map on the end papers indicate the countries visited in the poems. It includes four pages with one paragraph each of additional information about the subject of the poems. <clears throat> Poem the Night, as we said earlier, is the teen theme, so we'll look at some fiction for younger teens before we move on to older teens. <clears throat> Star Cross by Elizabeth C. Bunce. <clears throat> Digger, 16, is a pickpocket and a thief, so of course she's usually out at night. She escapes capture by becoming a lady's maid. Soon she is embroiled in a revolt against the king, who has outlawed magic, and she may be one key to the revolution's survival. The castle, secret passageways, a hidden prince, intrigue and danger will keep teens reading. And this one also will work again for next summer, the underground theme, because the castle that she and the people she's with are at has many tunnels underneath, leading to different parts of the forest. Book two in the sequel, and the sequel to Starcross is Liar's Moon, also by Elizabeth C. Bunce. Digger, who has been called Selene, during the first book and the second book, is back in the city. The revolt is coming closer and the king is continuing to make things harder for all. Lord Durrell is in prison for the murder of his wife, and Selene has promised to find the real murderer. Expect one more book in this series because this book ends on a, on a cliffhanger. <clears throat> Notes from a Totally Lame Vampire by Tim Collins. Nigel is a teenage vampire, and he has been around for almost a hundred years. Somehow, he never came into the vampire's speed, strength, or mesmerizing gaze. He gets zits and rashes from the sun, and he's too weak to hunt his own prey. They don't kill people, they just take a little bit of their blood. How will he ever convince Chloe, the new girl, to be his girlfriend? And the sequel is Prince of Dorkness by Tim Collins. I love that title. Subtitle, More Notes from a Totally Lame Vampire. <clears throat> the fall school session has started and Nigel is ignoring his new girlfriend Chloe's insistence that he change her into a vampire. A new guy at school, Jason, is large, strong, and fast. Chloe leaves Nigel and becomes Jason's girlfriend. Consequently, Nigel loses his powers and is back to being lame. And Jason turns out to be a werewolf. I know you all said that before I answered that. <laughs> Blindsided by Priscilla Cummings. Natalie is 14 and her sight has been failing over the years, but now the eye doctor says she will lose it all and quite soon. She is sent to the Maryland School for the Blind to learn the skills she will need when that happens. She resists her lessons, clinging to the hope that what vision she has will remain. But soon the inevitable happens and she must learn it all. It contains a good sense of the feelings of loss, adjustment, lessons that are needed, and Natalie's realization that she has to either embrace her new life now or live in fear. All those contribute to the story. 
The Spook's Bestiary, The Guide to Creatures of the Dark, is a companion book to the Last Apprentice series by Joseph Delaney. And this is sure to be popular with Last Apprentice readers. It contains stories of the spooky creatures, some of the spooky creatures, as well as stories about some of the spooks' former apprentices. The Summer of May by Cecilia Gallant. Really, I bought this book at the bookstore and thought, look, a great night book because of the cover. But it doesn't have anything to do with night. It's a lovely cover. <laughs> well, May is struggling. She's 12, and she needs to learn how to own the night or to own her own actions. She is lashing out at others since her mom left. May, her dad, and grandma are all struggling to continue. So one day, May spray paints her prim English teacher's classroom during lunch, and now she has a choice. Expulsion or a summer school class, class, class with just her and her English teacher. May's turnaround is not quick or easy. It contains humor, discovery, and a connection with others, and is well written. <clears throat> Wolf Storm by D. Gerritsen, a movie set at a deserted ski lodge in winter in Slovakia. This is Stefan. He's 14. This is his big break, even if he has to act with Diva Rain, who's 13. It doesn't take long for disaster to hit. Stefan, Rain, and Jeremy, who's 9, and the elder actor Cecil are alone at the lodge on the hillside one evening when an avalanche hits crushing everything. Not only that, but some very hungry wolves are nearby. Survival is their focus and goal over the next several nights. Moon Shadow, Rise of the Ninja by Simon Higgins is the first book in a new series. Moon Shadow has just received his name after passing the final test to become one of the agents for the Grey Light Order, Ninja Spy Warriors for the Shogun. His first task is extremely dangerous. He must steal the plans for a deadly weapon from a warlord anxious to overthrow the Shogun. It contains plenty of espionage techniques and fighting strategies and using one's intelligence to deal with new situations, as well as compassion for others. The second book in the series is The Nightmare Ninja, also by Simon Higgins. Two months after the first adventure, Moon Shadow and Nighthawk have just finished a spy mission when they are sent on a vital mission to protect the revered white men, and are soon aware of the ninjas trailing them to attack. This second book in the series maintains the suspense and intrigue of the first. Um, in the second book, that one of the ninjas who are following them has the ability to project a nightmare into Moon Shadow's mind while he's sleeping, and that's his way of trying to to control him and make make him less effective. So it's pretty interesting. I hope there's more in the series. Chasing Orion by Catherine Lasky. Georgie is 11, and she has little to do this summer. It is 1952, and polio is a big fear. Her family moves to a new house, and their next-door neighbor is Phyllis. She's 17, and she's in an iron lung. <clears throat> Georgie's older brother, Emmett, also about 17, is an amateur student of astronomy. He has never had a girlfriend, but he becomes attached to Phyllis. So attached that Georgie is starting to worry that Phyllis has a plan for Emmett to help her escape the iron lung forever. It gives a good sense of the fear at that time and how devastating polio could be. The intrigues of Georgie and her new friend Evelyn as they try to find out what is really going on will appeal to readers. This is a tricky book since Georgie is 11 and the romance is between 17-year-olds, but the story is told from Georgie's point of view. <clears throat> Vanishing Acts by Philip Margolin and Amy, Amy Mar Margolin Rome. Madison Kincaid is 12 and she is just starting junior high and she knows seventh grade will be great with her best friend Anne. Her father is an attorney, and she is surprised by two missing person mysteries. One is her former third grade teacher, and her father is defending her husband, who's been accused of murder. The other is her missing best friend. Why didn't Anna start junior high with her, and where is she? Mysteries to be solved. Nightmare by Joan Laurie Nixon. Emily Wood, 16, is sent to Camp Excel by her therapist due to her horrible nightmares. While at camp, she show, slowly remembers the events she witnessed as a child that resulted in someone's death. Now the murderer is after her. <clears throat> Disney After Dark, Kingdom Keepers Number 1 by Ridley Pearson. There are four books in this series so far. I've read the first book. In the first book, Disney After Dark, Finn is one of five teens chosen to model for Disney World's hologram hosts. 
It isn't until later that Finn begins to have dreams at night that turn out to be real. He is at Disney World in his hologram. The villains of Disney are growing in power and plan to spread their evil influence out beyond the theme park's borders. The five teams, teams are asked to help prevent it. The inner workings of the Disney parks and the adventure will appeal to preteens and teens. So, the Kingdom Keepers, Kingdom Keepers 2, Disney at Dawn, Disney in Shadow, number three, and the most recent one, Power Play, number four. I have not, like I said, I haven't read the, the final three of those, just the first book, but it's appealing, the mystery is intriguing, and the facts about Disney's world there is, is really an extra plus. This book scared me. I am easy to scare, <laughs> but oh my. <clears throat> the Nightmares by Dan Kulbaki. Timothy, in seventh grade, accidentally becomes the weird new girl Abigail's partner on a class project, angering his best friend. Starting with Timothy, Abigail, Stewart, and their teacher, Mr. Crane, they are all having strange and frightening nightmares. <clears throat> Abigail later reveals to Timothy that she sees the nightmares in the corner of her room at night, and they want her to come with them. Creepy was a mystery. The teens are trying to find out what is going on and how to stop it. The dreams are so frightening because of a very old jawbone and magic. This is an adaptation of Bram Stoker's work in modern language, Nicky Ray oh, sorry, Dracula, adapted by Nicky Raven. Nicky Raven states that he cut the story down to one-tenth of the original as far as amount of text. The story and artwork will attract readers who may then investigate the original. And I don't usually talk about adaptations, but this one really does a great job of carrying the story, and the artwork is really appealing, and, and I do think that maybe kids will read this and then at some point in the future want to read the original. <clears throat> Dark Times by Rob Rieger and Jessica Gruner. This is Emily the Strange Book 3. And you just have to dive in and go with Emily's flow because there's little to prepare the reader for Emily's unusual lifestyle. It's, um, Emily is an inventor of unique items. She has four cats that understand her, and she sleeps all day and is awake all night. She is homeschooling herself for ninth grade, and her mom is teaching her about their family history. When she learns that her great, 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 however many Aunt Lily died at the age of 13 of the white fever, <clears throat> she uses her time machine, powered by a unique substance, to visit 1790 and try to save her. Many complications arise. It is um, unusual, but um, Emily is quite an interesting character, and she's very determined. Dark by Angie Sage is Septimus Heat Series Book 6. Walter Mella has been banished accidentally, Septimus is preparing for his test against the dark when some of it leaps, leaks through and soon overtakes the castle. <clears throat> a huge dark dragon has appeared and will soon begin destroying the town and killing people. The only choice for Septimus is to go into the dark, rescue Alther, and stop the dark from spreading. It's another excellent tale. Little Vampire by Joanne Savar contains three stories told in graphic novel format about Little Vampire, his dog, Pantomato, and his new human friend, Michael. I still have some. Okay. I just keep thinking it's going to get better. <laughs> I just didn't know you're out. <laughs> In the first story, a little vampire goes to school at night, and he does Michael's homework for him. In the second, Michael gets kung fu lessons to help with a bullet. And in the third, the three of them go to a lab to break out three dogs. The youngsters think of things like killing the bullies, but as Boya says, in each instance, a mini lesson is taught on tolerance and responsibility. And that's very true. Two of the stories were previously published separately, separately but now there are three in this volume. <clears throat> Last year's um, Newbery winner, Moon Over Manifest, by Claire Vanderpool, works great for this theme. Abilene Tucker is 12, and she is sent to live in Manifest, Kansas, by her father, who is going to work for the railroad in Iowa. Over the summer of 1936, she learns a lot about the town and the people who live there, but never hears a mention of her father. Frequent flashbacks in 1917 and 1918, as told to Abilene by the local clairvoyant, recount stories of two friends, Jinx and Ned. This book covers a lot of topics with a gentle hand. 
prohibition, making moonshine, responsibility, labor rights, immigration, acceptance, con men, war, and the 1918 flu epidemic, and family love. It's hard to do better than that. The Witch's Kitchen by Alan Williams is a creepy story about a toad waking up in a dark kitchen, being dangled over a pot bubbling with green slime. Rescued from her fate of immersion in the pot, the toad soon learns that she is in the witch's kitchen, where light is not welcome, and many things will try to eat her. Eat her. The furniture constantly moves around in the kitchen, and strange creatures appear unexpectedly. She knows the witches will want to capture her again. There's good scary tension and creepy illustrations scattered throughout the book, and this will appeal to boys, even though the toad is a sheep. A couple books by Rick Yancey really fit this theme well. The first one is The Monstrumologist. The main character, Will Henry, is 12, and he is the assistant to Dr. Warthrop, a monstrumologist, one who studies and defeats various monsters in the world. A knock at the door in the middle of the night begins this adventure when a local grave robber brings in a strange and fearsome dead creature. The monstrumologist is certain there are more such creatures, and they must be destroyed as soon as possible. This book scared me more than the nightmares. <laughs> Like I said, I'm a wimp. The other book, The Curse of the Wendigo, oh, the next one, it's a sequel. Will Henry and Dr. Warthrop travel to the north to look for a missing colleague. John Chandler was seeking the Wendigo, also known by other names. And if you look on that cover, those who can see it, you see somebody with some sharp teeth that looks like a vampire. Dr. Warthrop insists it does not exist. It is a myth. They encounter danger, despair, and terrible hardship. And when they return, the ordeal is not over. Some nonfiction for teens. The Bat Scientists by Mary Kay Carlson is another excellent title in the Scientists in the Field series. And the lure of pat, bats should make this popular. The Lives of Stars by Ken Crosswell has enhanced photos from the Hubble Space Telescope and others, as well as a few drawings that will attract browsers and star fans alike. They talk about um, various types of stars, planetary nebula, and other things. And it has a glossary and an index. The Darking by Paul Janesco. Uh, the subtitle is True Spy Stories. And it's written in an appealing way. It blends intriguing facts with some well-known and some not so well-known spies and histories. Beginning with the American Revolutionary War, the author identifies some of the spies that saved our revolution and notes some of their methods. He moves on to the American Civil War, World War I and II, and concludes with the Cold War, and with a case of U.S. agents turning over secrets to others, U.S. secrets. I think this will really appeal to um, boys because of the, the cover and the, the topic. Some fiction for older teens. Beautiful Creatures by Cami Garcia and Margaret Stoll is the sequel to Beautiful Creatures. No, Beautiful Darkness. Is the title I'm going to talk about now. It's the second book. Beautiful Creatures is the first book. Sorry. Lena blames herself for her uncle Megan's death and separates herself from everyone, including Ethan, except her cousin Ridley and new to Gatlin, John Reed. As Ethan looks into what happened the night Megan died and tries to reconnect with Lena, he learns her mother is trying to force Lena's 17th moon to arrive early. Book three, Beautiful Chaos, came out last um, October, and I haven't gotten a hold of that one yet. <clears throat> Faithful by Claudia Gray is a paranormal romance involving werewolves, social customs and taboos of the day, and a voyage on the Titanic. And this will appeal to wow. you. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I get a laugh about that. It's a lot of different it's things. It's a lot of different <laughs> things, but the author does pretty well. I enjoyed this title. Mm -hmm. Tess is a lady's maid in a British household and has plans to leave her service when the ship reaches oh. New York, but she hasn't told her boss. She encounters Alec, a first-class passenger, and an American gentleman, oh, he's also a werewolf, and loses her heart, even though he's being sought by the Brotherhood, who wants him to join them. Avoiding danger is nearly impossible on board ship, and Tess must try her best to avoid angering her employer. Details of the Titanic add to the story. Born at Midnight is the first title in the new Shadow Falls series, though I haven't seen any title, other titles in this series either. Kylie is 16, and she is sent to Shadow Falls Camp when she is included in the group arrested for alcohol and drugs at a party. She was not partaking. She was just trying to get her best friend to leave. She soon learns that everyone at camp is special. 
witches, fairies, vampires, werewolves, and more are at camp. But why is Kylie there? She doesn't have any of those things. She believes it is a mistake. But when the director asks her what time she was born, and Kylie says midnight, that is the giveaway. Now they wait to see what Kylie's special talents are. Vampire Academy by Michelle Reed. This is the graphic novel version of the first book in that series. It's well done. It carries the story and leaves the reader hoping the rest of the series will be redone in graphic novel format. I had read the first book in this series in um, text, or paper, or print, whatever I'm trying to say. And I thought that this graphic novel did a great job with the story. Vampire oh wait, Fire Spell by Chloe Neal is the first book in a new series called The Dark Elite. Lily is sent to boarding school in Chicago from upstate New York while her parents take a sabbatical to Germany. A high school junior, Lily is not happy with this major change. However, she soon, soon learns one of her new roommates is involved in something that keeps her out late at night and is very dangerous. Lily follows her and is enmeshed in a conflict between two groups with magical abilities. Lily has no such abilities, but she wants to help her roommate scout and her group to protect others. Star Climber by Kenneth Oppel is the third steampunk novel of the Airborne series, which included Airborne and then Skycatcher. It's an alternate world that's mostly like our own. Matt, now 17, and Kate are hoping to be included on the crew for the first trip into space. Matt must train with 100 other hopefuls, while Kate is assured her spot based on her past accomplishments. The adventure, danger, and some romance maintains the quality of the first books. Going up into the realm of the stars is one way to own the night. And the last book on my list, The Midnight Palace by Carlos Luis Safon. Set in 1930s Calcutta, Ben meets his twin sister, Shear, on the eve of their 16th birthday. It is soon obvious that some evil is looking to do them harm. Ben, his friends, and Shear seek answers and help during the next terrible nights. And that's what I have. Thank you. And I went way over. I'm sorry. Oh, that is okay. Most of our group has stuck around. So that, okay. is, that is great. Thank you very much, Sally. That was actually lots, tons of awesome books to read. Yes. Every time you do one of these, I'm like, I need to get that one and that one. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> oh, and I meant to say that I will put up my more recent list. I do have up on, if you go to the Library Commission webpage and in the search section type handouts, mm -hmm. a list of handouts from sessions mm -hmm. I've done pops up. And so the, the list from last fall's NLA NEMA conference is up, but I need to put my expanded list up there. The new book. And I'll put the, just the titles up right away today, and then I'll add, later I'll add the blurbs that I bring. Okay, great, yeah. Um, when we put up the recording for this session, we'll link to that page the handouts page, so you'll have a quick link to that as well. Um, and all the PowerPoints presentation that is here will also be included as well, that you'll be able to get to that to see all the book covers, um, just to help you find these books when you're looking for them. <laughs> um, so yes, thank you so much, Shelley. We're thrilled to have you come here to do this every time. I know you do the summer reading program workshops across the state, but as you were saying before we started, um, not everyone can make it to those. So it's great to have be able to do this, that people can come today or watch the recording of this now afterwards. Um, so thank you very much for attending our summer reading program uh, session today. I hope to join us next week when our session will be about Library Snapshot Day, specifically Nebraska's Library Snapshot Day, um, which is a one day in the life of Nebraska libraries. It actually takes place for a week, um, April 15th to 21st. Um, and next week we will have a, um, before that week, a session of people um, explaining what it's all about. So Great. you can participate in it the week after. So thank you very much for attending, and we will hope to see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.